Yeah. Hello, and welcome to another Learning Circles, says my desk vibrates crazy like. Uh, it's with uh, Brunch Lanker, Enzo Silva, and Craig Wiggins, except minus the Craig Wiggins today. And in his place, sitting Craig beautifully, is, is, uh, yeah, is Connie Malmed. Welcome, Connie. Uh, thanks, Brent. I'll try to take Craig's place. I'm not sure if I can. Just you, the only the only rule is is that you can't talk about XAPI. Mm, that was my topic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so I think we might also be having another guest join us. Melissa Malloway uh, might be joining us a little later, so that will be fun. But uh, it, while we uh, while we wait and get started on this, why don't we just go through and do a couple um, basic introductions. So, Connie, you're on the far left of my screen at the bottom, so why don't you start us off and just give us a little bit of background on who you are and how you got into this crazy field we all work in and, and anything else you want to tell us. I got into it in the coolest way. I was doing a job for... Um I was applying for a job in Austin, and I was at a computer lab, and the person who was interviewing me said she was getting her PhD in instructional design, and I'd been wondering, is there a way that you can design instructional materials? Seriously, I was wondering that. That was like about 25 years ago, and when she, as soon as she said instructional design, I'd never heard the term before, and when she said I'm getting my doctorate in instructional design, I almost fell off my chair, and... Before you knew it, I was in a program at UT studying it. It was just so cool. And back then, they were, they were teaching you how to do interactive videos on those big laser discs. So uh, I've been through been through it all. Nice. I remember the laser discs. They still had those around when I was uh, doing graduate school at uh, ASU. I remember. And we also did those multiple slide projector. Uh, that was multimedia back then, right? The multimedia I class. Know. You had to you had to sync uh, projectors together, and uh, and that was multimedia. <laughs> I'm the proverbial millennial. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> All right, Enzo, you're next. Um, well, I'm an instructional designer and senior uh, senior instructional designer and learning strategist here, working at SAP right now, uh, and having fun trying to bring in uh, learning trends and innovations into what we do at SAP and to the field in general. Love talking across, I don't say boundaries, uh, you know, between companies and stuff like that. So I love talking across companies with people, with experts like uh, like Brent, Craig, Connie, and, and people all over the place. So it's all about conversation. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, well, and again, I'm Brent Schlenker. I work for litmus.com as their corporate learning strategist, officer, whatever you want to, uh, whatever the official term is these days. But... Uh, so yeah, having fun doing this. So let's jump right in. Last week we had a couple topics that we were going to. Uh, oh, first of all, Connie, how much time do you have with us today? I really only have thirty minutes because Enzo asked me at the last minute. Oh, Enzo, uh, hey, what? What? No, no, this is being recorded. Uh, this, this is being recorded. I had sent her chats on Google Plus like weeks and months ago. Oh, that's true. But that's not read them. <laughs> months ago, oh. No problem. Well, then let's just cut to the chase then. We won't go back and, uh, and recap anything else we've talked about. Let's just jump right into your book, Connie. That is really the real reason why we're here besides the fact that you always have wonderful things to say uh, about our industry, but now it is all compiled in a book. Tell us about it. All of it. Well, you know, I did forget to mention um, that I am the person behind the site, the e-learning coach, because some people know me through that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's your Twitter uh, handle also, right? Right, at eLearning Coach. Um, so is this backwards? Nope. Now, why isn't it backwards? Huh, interesting. Anyway, here's my new book. It just came in the other day. Um, it's kind of like having a baby. We work really hard uh, to produce it and... Uh, um, it's basically a visual design book only for learning professionals, not for the big, uh, not for a wider audience. And the goal behind it was because I know a lot of people struggle, and uh, e-learning is a very visual medium. So I thought that 
when I realized there was no book that actually teaches visual design in, re in terms of, in the context of e-learning, slides, job aids, learning portals, those kinds of things, I decided I wanted to write a book about it. I have a background in art education. That's what my undergrad degree is in. Nice. That will explain a lot then. <laughs> yeah, I, so I, I've had the pleasure of attending several of your sessions, uh, or whether watching a recording online or just uh, just going. I just I think was it ATD wherever it was. I just went to one of your sessions. Um, I'm always following your stuff. Whenever I uh, need to recommend a storyboard or something like that, I go to your storyboard repository that you have on your. Uh, Thanks, your Enzo. Uh, and so I like your approach to things. Now, what, is there in your book? I haven't read it yet because it just came out. Right? You haven't. I mean, it's been out two days. Nice. Is there anything there about developing visuals uh, for learning when you were not a graphic designer, right? Which is something I like to discuss with people and present about. It's you know, many times we want to do a uh, very appealing visual and all that, but we we don't know. Uh, we don't have the expertise that people have with Photoshop and Adobe. Yes. Right. Well, let me check the index and see. Mm. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Yes, actually, book? actually, I would say that the book really is for people who are not uh, graphic designers. That's who it's for. Um, so the first part talks about. Uh, how often in instructional design we don't think of ourselves as designers, but notice design is in the word. Yeah. Learning designer, instructional designer. So we really are all designers, and we just have to start thinking like them. Um, it goes on to I go on to say that you can get good at visual design even if you can't render, even if you're not an artist, because they're two really different things, even though they may be based on similar principles. An artist expresses him or herself. It um, art comes from within, but for design, you're really working for someone else. You're really trying to fulfill the objectives of someone else, the stakeholder. You're trying to make very clear communication. Um, you only want one interpretation as opposed to art, so it's really quite different. That's why people can learn it. You don't even have to be able to draw. Um, if you draw storyboards and sketch out ideas and stick figures and geometric shapes, that is enough to communicate. So, yeah. I think the, I, for me, the hardest part is always in the balance, right? Like when I see really, really good graphic designers or, or a design that I really like, one of the things that I notice always is um, a, a great use of white space and, you know, the selection of... Uh, just sizes of elements and where they're placed on the screen and I can look at something and say oh, that's really I like that that's I can tell a designer a really good graphic designer with some real chops did that and that's so I immediately think well how hard can that be I can do that <laughs> right and you go and you look at a blank canvas even just a PowerPoint slide or something right or you know and you try to start placing elements and it just doesn't come so easily you look at it and it's like okay that's what I want but something's just not right it doesn't look quite as cool as the way a trained graphic designer can do it and, and I've you know, I've proven it over and over again to myself. I'll take something that I think is done and I'll hand it over to a graphic designer and say, can you just polish this up a little bit? And they don't do much. They just do tiny little things to it and it comes back and all of a sudden, whoa, it looks ten times better. That's but cool. it's still basically the same, you know? But, so I, I think too, uh, many times we, you said something that like struck my memory here. I think one thing is many times we are, uh, when we're designing, we don't have, we, we feel like we have to stare at a blank, blank page, but we don't. There's so much out there that we can uh, get started with a design by looking or using a template, for example, or looking at what other people have done and dissecting that and trying to adapt that to what we're using. There are actually so many tutorials out there that uh, basically they take a logo, for example, and dissect that, and you can just reuse the assets there or replicate that and, and adapt it to what you need. So we don't have a blank canvas. 
uh, I think it's it's actually probably, especially when we're not graphic designers, it might be a waste of time to start from a blank canvas. Why not use resources that are out there uh, to start from some canvas and expand that? I think you both have valid points. Um, you, it's really good to heighten your awareness and to look at what other designers are doing and to copy and modify it for yourself. Other times you won't be able to find something that works for you and you will be starting from blank. So here's some advice I have. Uh, first of all, it really helps to think that there are only three components of visual design. It's the organization of graphics or images and type in two-dimensional space. So you're only working with three things, space, a typeface, and an image. And that kind of is a way to wrap your head around it. Mm -hmm. And of course I have a, a chapter that tells, that talks about each one of those three components. But, um, wait, there was something else I wanted to say about it. Oh yeah, the other thing is, the very first thing you should think about is, what is your instructional goal? And when you find your instructional goal, then you know what you want people to look at first. And that allows you to build a visual hierarchy. So the visual hierarchy usually has about three levels. And it and it's pretty much says shows where I want someone to look first, second, and third. So once you know where you want someone to look at first, is it the text? Is it the graphic? Is it a video? You make that the largest, the brightest. You put it at the top. There are different ways to create a visual hierarchy, and that's one of the principles of visual design. So, once you have the very, so that's like a clue, okay? I want um, the picture of this, um, a diagram to be the first thing people say before they read the explanation. Well, then you're going to make that the largest, and then maybe the explanation is going to be on the side. So that's kind of how you start thinking about it, so you know where to place things. I don't know, does that, does that help any? Also, ton. it helps a ton, and just to kind of follow up on what Enzo said too, um, you know, I don't know if you guys have uh, used Canva.com. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a wonderfully cool tool. A whole bunch of templatized sort of tools have come out in the past that I've seen in one form or another. But that one, by far, for me, is the best and the most useful. But again, I mean, it, it's like. I'll look at one of the templates that they have. It's like, oh, that's that's kind of what I want to say. And as soon as I start kind of taking things apart and replacing their text with my text, it can very quickly go from, you know, the template looked really nice with their words in it, but my word that I put in there or my multiple words all of a sudden throws, you know, that visual element that they had in there totally off. And so then you kind of struggle with, okay, well, how do I then get that balance back or that white space? And and um, you know, it just it just becomes a challenge. And I think I I think I you know I don't know I'm just graphically challenged. I think maybe because I, it shouldn't be so easy to screw up somebody's really nice design by just changing the words, right? But well, but, I think people have to stop having that defeating uh, mindset of saying that you're. Challenge. You just haven't been trained. That's all. Yeah. Or you know, I think goes. It probably goes back to what Connie said too about that hierarchy. Probably by adding more text there, you broke right. that hierarchy that they had set up really nicely. And now you have to rearrange things, make some parts of it bigger that you want to make prominent, and move things around, change the typeface, for example, right? One thing that visual designers often do is work with a grid, and almost no one in our field who's an instructional designer lays out a grid and uses that. For example, like there's the rule of thirds where, I mean, you can center things and centering things is okay. That's a symmetrical layout. But you can also make things asymmetrical and that's a little bit more dynamic. And so when you use the rule of thirds, when you divide the screen up into nine, um, nine squares, nine cells, nine rectangles, uh, you can put things right on the power lines, right on right on the lines and right on the points that intersect, and that can be a starting place for you because that makes it a little bit more dynamic. And, and I've to, always used that in photography. I've always had the rule of yeah. thirds in mind when I'm taking pictures, but I've never thought of that uh, as instructional design or graphic placement of images for e-learning and whatnot too, but it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to see if I can find a, an example of it. 
But see, so if you can do photography, you're not visually challenged. That's why I think people need, should stop um, putting themselves down about it and stop saying they're not creative and they're not visual. They just haven't been trained. That's really all it is. And once you get, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's not a lifelong endeavor. I'm always trying to get better. It's, it is a lifelong practice. Yeah. But once you at least get started in it, I think um, you'll slowly start to see yourself improve. Got to see if I can find my rule of thirds. A lot of trial and error, right? And a lot of times I just don't have the time to go through that process. So I think that's why it ends up, I end up not being happy with it, but I end up using it anyways. But I, I know if I do take time and, you know, and as I'm modifying somebody else's design to kind of suit mine or take a template and, and put my own stuff in it, as I start to ruin it, I know how to go back and fix it, right? I know basically what I've done wrong, but a lot of times it's just, it's just a matter of, like you said, not having practiced enough to be able to get it right in, in a shorter time frame than having to go through this trial and error of, oh wait, maybe just a different font would fix this, or maybe resizing it's going to fix it, or, you know, that kind of thing. So I think the way is an important part of it. Like, you play around, you try this, you try that, and then suddenly you get an idea and you go, oh, that's it. Yeah. You know? And that, that, that's always seems how it works, right? It's very strange where um, as you're going through and you're just messing around with certain things, all of a sudden something will just click and lock into place and you'll yeah. be like, oh, that's, that's what I was trying to do. But it just, you know, and you, then you're like, well, it took me an hour to get there. <laughs> you it know? is time consuming for sure. I don't, know if you, I don't know if this is clear, but okay. But this one is not on the... <laughs> This one uh, is not on the rule of thirds, this oh, is yeah. not, and the one next to it is, and it's just a little bit more interesting and dynamic. It's not saying that you can't ever center something, but it, it just makes you more aware of it. You know, once you can, I don't think you can see the grid lines, but that that woman um, is placed on in the third, and it, it just makes it a little bit more interesting. No, that yeah, that definitely proves the point for sure. It definitely makes for a more interesting shot. So yeah. you might have some uh, tips like that, right, with visuals to explain visual design for instructional designers, right? Yeah, the first part talks about, there's four sections, 384 pages or so, um, and about 100, I don't know, 40 graphics or something. It's, it's really, I was surprised when I saw it, when it just came the other day, because I thought it was going to be fatter, 384 or whatever it is. Mm. But they did it. They know, they know how to make a book that's that you can actually carry without getting a, your arms hurt. Yeah, those are those are my favorite kind of books. I gotta tell you, instead of uh, instead of hardbacks, I love books like that, especially design books, because uh, I always take them to uh, Kinko's or you know whatever your favorite copy store is, and I have them just saw the binding off and put a spiral binding on it so that it, it can cool. so that it sits. It's open, right, and can and can sit flat, and it doesn't always want to fold up on you. So it's a, a quick tip if anybody has that same frustration. It doesn't cost that much. Yeah, I wonder. You know, really, publishers should make more of those, uh, more with that kind of binding. That that would make, and for recipe books too. Yeah, right. Well, it's probably really expensive to do in mass, right? It's probably a heck of a lot. The machines are probably <laughs> made to to just use the glue and you know, whip them out, you know, really fast. So right. I, I don't mind doing it. So I always just, I always tell, you know, it's nice when publishers leave a little bit of space right there at the seam <laughs> so, that, so that I don't lose too much text when I have the holes drilled. Yeah, that's a pretty decent mo inner margin. But um, back to what you were saying, Enzo. Um, so the first part of the book is more like a how to be a designer and how to think like a designer and also a lot of graphic tips because a lot of people don't know things like the difference between a ping file and a JPEG where they don't know that when you're given two numbers the first one is the width and the second one is the height. So just some basic technical stuff that I think instruction designers will be happy to know. And then the next part is about um, the three components of design, uh, you know, space, images, and typography. Three chapters in that. And then the next part is all these different principles like um, how to make your design unified, how to use contrast, how to build a visual hierarchy. And then the fourth part are lots of ideas and inspiration, how to make it exciting, how to make numbers interesting. I've done workshops and I tried to pull, you know, I learned so much from people in the audience, or the participants, 
um, when they ask questions, and, and they, people will always say things that I never would have thought of, you know. And I try to incorporate that into uh, into the book, and especially in that fourth part that, that has a lot of different ideas. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Very nice. So tell me, tell me before we before we let you go off to your other busy things. Um, so what's like? Let's talk a little bit about the connection between those graphic visual images. I mean, and maybe you talk about this in the book or not. Yeah, but, I'm um, like, like what the you know the traditional instructional designer you know besides just the visually compelling nature of being good at this and at least understanding the basics like what does it hold instructionally for an instructional designer you know where does where does the where do the two meet where you start to see that overlap and that value it's a good question um, and I do talk about it some uh, well pictures capture attention um, we use more brain resources to process visual information than any other sense by a lot. They, some scientists think that up to 50% of our brain, at least the, the cortex, the outer layer, is um, devoted to visual processing. So we're kind of, we're really wired for graphics. I guess we're also wired for story, but we're also really wired for graphics extremely. So they capture attention. Um, we also process graphics in parallel. If you look at a diagram, just think about it, you see the whole thing. You don't do that when you see a page of text. Text is going to be processed linearly. So it kind of short circuits it and it's good for cognitive um, cognitive load because bam, you just see it and you process it. Um, those are two things. Also making something aesthetically appealing, they're finally doing some research on that and it's pretty fascinating. And making something aesthetically appealing, as you know, because you've experienced it, makes you feel motivated, makes you feel positive, which is such an important part of learning. So those are three things um, just off the top of my head or four that um, and it also gives you another channel for understanding. So I'm not saying you need only pictures. If we just had a picture without the text, without the audio, that wouldn't necessarily work either. But the two together work really well to help uh, improve comprehension. And there is research that shows it improves retention too. It's basically, it's just basically ideal. Yeah, and I think something Something you mentioned in uh, uh, one of your workshops also is that with a visual, with a picture, you kind of help people of different backgrounds understand the same story that you're trying to tell, where text leaves a lot for interpretation, more than the visual would, if the visual is well designed. Yeah, that, so that was something, yeah. At, at ATD I was talking about that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, if two people go see a movie, or no, sorry, if two people read a book, they a fiction book. They imagine things in their minds, and, and of course, two different ways. Nobody's going to have the same uh, internal imagery. But when you go see a movie, you see the same thing. And it, 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 that's a good point. And so, um, so therefore, when you see a graphic, there's hopefully, if it's done well, there's only one way to interpret it. Yeah. So everybody's got the same common denominator there. You know, there's one other thing I wanted to say, Grant, in terms of your struggles with design. Um, one approach that's really good is subtractive design. You get the graphic all together, and then you start throwing away everything that's not needed, up to the point where the design would break. And that's called subtractive design. I, I wrote an article on the on the e-learning coach, and um, I do that all the time. You know, because you go, oh, a pretty background, that'd be so cool. And you know what? I saw this nice curvy shape. That would be awesome. And then you look at it and you go, what? <laughs> I don't need that, and I don't need this. And people will laugh at me when they'll say, some of my clients will say, can you make me a template? And I hand them, like, basically a gray background and, like, you know, something very, very simple. And they go, that's a template? And I go, yeah, just use it, and you'll see. That's going to work better than any crazy thing. Because we're, we're really not going for art awards. We're going to help yeah. people understand things and to communicate and simplicity is the best way to do that and then not overloading them so yeah making it it's always seems funny I, I very distinctly remember experiencing that when I was doing a lot more development work back in the day where it's almost like the more the more simplistic you make something the, the less people think 
the less work people think you did to get there. But in fact, it's totally the inverse opposite. Exactly. It, it comes with like user user design, user experience design is the same way. Interface design, right. uh, I've found even with talking with those folks that specialize in it. Right? If you you know when you see a website or when you see a design or something and it looks incredibly simple and it's easy to use, you know that somebody on the back end spent a boatload of time figuring that out, designing it and taking away and what what can we get away with that's the ultimate minimum but yet still be able to portray that one message that we're trying to portray and yeah it just it's uh, it, it's funny how some people that haven't had the experience to know that or been introduced to that immediately wonder like well, what I you know like they could have done it or why did I pay you so much for that it just looks so simple yeah it's yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's the classic one quote uh, if I had time I would have made it simpler uh, forget who said that but it's uh, it's true I mean, it's easier to throw together everything that you have templates wise and all that and throw it all in one thing it's harder to do the, the subtractive design that, that Connie's talking about where you actually take out everything that doesn't matter and only leave the essential and which is the basic of instructional design that's what we're doing information is out there what we're doing is helping people make sense of that information in a practical right. well, isn't, yeah so I mean that's a great point from an instructional design perspective isn't that really what we end up doing when we work with subject matter experts is subjective yeah. design because this subject matter expert always wants to put everything that they know into it because they know they just they're so passionate about it and they think every last little bit is so important that everybody needs to know so it's our job to get in there and say mm, no not really that no not really that no not really that you know we just need this little bit and it's always frustrating for the subject matter experts but um, you know us getting in there and being sort of the middleman for the the end user the learner at the end of the day and doing that subtractive design is where all the value is that we provide right so yeah I think Brent just by admitting that that's what he does in instructional design has just confessed that he's not as visually challenged as he, is, as he claimed to be we, we never believed it. We never believed it. <laughs> you know, I'm I, glad was, that, I'm glad I was you, trying to be controversial. <laughs> I'm glad that you mentioned user experience because that's really what it's all about. The visual design and the user experience are very tied together. And so a nice, simple visual design is going to give us a positive user experience, just like a nice, simple UI will, too. Yep. And maybe um, we'll have to end there because I've got um, a couple projects do clients uh, you know how it goes yeah oh, yeah well, it's perfect so timing much. yeah no worries but thanks for just taking a little bit of time and uh, talking this through with us appreciate it you know I really had a good time and I would really Craig has invited me before and I would really like to be able to join in I'm just usually behind in my work but I love talking about this stuff and I work alone so you know I'm lonely I need people to talk to <laughs> oh, you have a funny bunch here. Let's do it. Uh, we'll uh, make sure invite you on the other channels uh, yeah, later the, on. The I, invitation I, is always there, Connie, anytime. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for inviting me. All righty, bye-bye. Thank you. So I am getting that book now. <laughs> uh, yeah, there. right? Fine. Yeah, for sure. I just I saw it on Amazon. Maybe I should throw the link up there um, yeah. in the notes. Yeah, she's, she's I'm also trying to find where I ping Melissa from usually, but I don't see her there. But anyways, uh, just to kind of keep us going here. So we talked a little bit last week about the video challenge that I posted a few weeks ago on the litmus.com blog. And uh, Craig actually downloaded the video, and he's going to do a, a, a version of his, or at least write about it. So we're, uh, but he's been busy, so he'll have that for us next week. So in two weeks, when we talk again, uh, we should have something fun from him. And I had a couple of other folks. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that? We should see a next API example of that. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's going to be awesome. I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah, it's got to have XAPI in it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That'll be good. All right, what was Connie's book again? Um, I'll just look it up by her name. Yeah, there you go. Visual design. There we go. Visual design principle create inspiration for learning professionals. There you go. And I will grab this link and pop it into the chat. And we'll put it in the description of the video too with the notes. There we go. Boom. Oh yeah, you've been putting notes in. Awesome. So uh, yeah, so I don't really know uh, what really else to say about the challenge other than uh, if anybody's watching this after the fact, um, I, it's this is not something I'm gonna let go of, and it's not gonna. There's no end to it. If you want the video, just contact me, shoot me an email, uh, a message on G Plus, whatever, and. Um, like I mentioned last week, you don't actually have to build something. Uh, just watch the video and write about what you would do differently, uh, what you would do, uh, you know, how you might re-edit it, or how you might, um, you know, chunk it into smaller bits, or split it up across time, or add other types of visual elements onto it. You know, I. I, I'm just looking for it to spark conversation and for people to look at something and, and also quite honestly for us to have something to talk about where um, we can say, you know what, I mean, I created that video 25 years ago on a VHS, uh, you know, big giant VHS video recorder and edited it on two big editing machines and, that had you know, top-loading VHS-style tapes, and, you know, if we could put stuff like that together, and while it probably isn't the most instructionally sound, it is educational, and there's content in there that you learn from, or at the very least sparks interest. So there's this idea that um, since everybody's creating content out there, that that's a problem and that's a bad thing, and I, I think... It doesn't always have to be us creating learning content. So that's uh, those are the kind of conversations I want people to start having and talking about. So um, exactly. Maybe all uh, maybe part of what we do is empowering our uh, subject matter experts, for example, to even though they don't have they might not have background in learning, to actually produce some of the content for us for what we're doing. Right. Right. Well, I mean that's. Um, I, I kind of alluded to that in another recent blog post, but I mean, one of the practical things that I learned in providing business value via the training department is doing just that, right? Not being so, you know, traditionally trained in instructional design. We spend a lot of time sitting with our subject matter experts trying to get all of this information out of them. We take notes. We, we, we were, you know, taught how to interview subject matter experts. You know, people are still out there talking about that. And what I finally realized over doing this over and over and over again in many, many years of doing it and seeing just how painstakingly long it is and review cycles with subject matter experts and, mm -hmm. and committees and all that kind of stuff, what I really realized was there's got to be a faster way and an easier way for us to provide, to utilize the subject matter expert and provide business value to the, the learners that need it right away, right? When you're in a bit of a in a situation in a business that's moving fast, technology's moving fast, the business is moving fast, and people need information quickly. I just learned that, you know, why not, you know, let the subject matter expert be what they want to be and talk about what they want. If they want to include everything in the kitchen sink, great. Give them an hour long classroom and let them include as much as they possibly feel like they can in that hour and then just videotape it. 
And what you get from that video and the feedback from the people that had to experience that hour long is great fodder for going back to that subject matter expert and say, here's all the feedback. You know, everybody said they would have liked to have heard more of this, less of this, whatever. They like this a lot. They need this more. They need this less. And now you can go in and you can start. Now they've gotten value, right? You've got some people that have gotten value. You've recorded that presentation. You've you've cut that presentation loose, right? Hopefully you've published it either via your LMS or in an internal uh, enterprise social network. And now everybody can see it and everybody can gain some value from it. Is it the best possible instructional solution? You know, maybe not, but it's good enough at that point. Now you've got something solid and concrete. You've added value to the business and you've got something you can now look at and start to dissect and figure out, okay, what would be a more instructionally sound way to deliver some of these pieces? And that's that, that it's part of that whole iterative design process I talk about. So, exactly. So, uh, and this is one thing, and, and that brings back the subject that we touched on today, the subtractive design, right? Because that is something that I have done several times. There was once we were uh, trying to push a new tool for salespeople, uh, not so much neutral, but they were using it wrong and all that. And I got together with the you know, subject matter expert, and I asked them, can you share your screen on how you do what you do? I did not put any limits on it. Let's do it for an hour. You showed me how you do it, the whole process. And what I did then is was after I got that recording, I asked, can I record this? It was informal. Can I record this? I recorded it, and then I got that video out of uh, Adobe Connect or whatever it was, WebEx, I think we used it at a time. Uh, and I got that recording, and I dissected that recording, and chunked it up, removed the parts that weren't as important, the, the anecdotal pieces that didn't match up, left the ones that did kind of add to the story, you know, why you're using the tool, for example. Uh, removed everything that didn't make much sense, instructionally speaking, that matched my objectives that I already had written down. Right? I already knew what the objectives were that I was looking for. And, uh, I, and she had actually already validated those, so they were solid objectives. Then I chunked the pieces in that matched those objectives and all that, augmented them with some self-based uh, um, uh, job aids, typical PDF, do this, do this, do this. Uh, and, and it was actually instructionally sound. But it came out of recording a subject matter expert for an hour, an hour and ten minutes or whatever, just ranting on and on and on about what she did to make it work, what she looked at too, what she didn't, how those people should do it, blah, blah, blah. I took out the essentials. And... Yeah. And th there is a lot to empower, and, and the person feels validated you know, as an expert. You know, yeah. at the same time, you're building a good relationship with them because they feel like they're heard. I mean, they're yeah. not people, and they're passionately talking about their stuff that they love. Right? Yeah. It's so traditionally, it's it's a beautiful example because traditionally, right, we would have been taught to take all that information and write a script and then go back and have somebody, whether it's them or somebody else, go through those steps and record it and do a voiceover with all of the things that that subject matter expert said beautifully, but now you're having somebody else do it, you know, because what they did and what you recorded was, you know, informal and not, you know, in some people's minds, maybe not professional enough or, you know, whatever. You know, I just, I think that, that mentality, that really old school style, which is you know the way I think we used to see things, thankfully has been kind of tossed aside because our, our learners are more used to more authentic, more real subject matter experts just talking about what they're passionate about, right? The part that you added was just making it a little bit easier to consume instead of them having to parse it all out in their mind what the key parts were. You did a little bit of that work for the learner ahead of time and then yeah. everybody wins, like you said, right? And then there's there's these little side wins of building you know, some trust and a relationship with the subject matter experts. There's so much value to be gained in that, and I think yeah. we ignore it sometimes. Yeah, we ignore it because we, want, we have a stiffened uh, model that we have to follow, you know, that we feel like we have to follow many times, and and we, lose, we miss out on some, you know, this wasn't even supposed to be a meeting where I'm recording. I'm like, you know, I, I was planning on recording formally, why right? didn't we just do this, and I chunk it up. Save the person's time. They don't have to do it twice. Uh, and speaking of authenticity, uh, yeah. how much worse would it have been if I had done the traditional way and have that person explain, 
turn that into notes and scripts, and then give it to somebody that's going to record it like this and that the user can't relate to because they were talking like a radio announcer watching the screens going by. You know, it's you can't relate to that as much. And, you know, here is a woman speaking casually, very nicely, about the, the topic that I needed. So, awesome. Yeah, sorry, I just got, I just saw a tweet from Melissa saying there's no link to join, but I DM'd it to her, and I don't know why it's not working for her, so I'm going well, to, I'm, I, I'm, I pasted it live, so if we get a bunch of crazies in... <laughs> I think she will need to join us uh, next week, right? It's about time we end anyway. Yeah, yeah, but if we can get her to jump on for a few minutes, that might be good too. Because you know, just you and I babbling at each other. It might be her that's actually viewing our our one viewer today. It's a busy Friday for people. We got one. That's a plus one zero. <laughs> That might, must be my mom watching. Yeah, right I was going to say, uh, who do you ask in your family to watch? All right, well, I, uh, I don't even know if that's going to go out. I started using TweetDeck recently at the uh, at, um, watching... My friend Brian Fanzo do a little talk on how he uses, uh, how he does his Twitter accounts and how he manages everything and that he does. And, um, you know. I haven't seen Tweet Neck in a while. I haven't, I haven't used yeah, it. Yeah, you know, and I hadn't either. And I, because I just use Hootsuite, right? And uh, so I thought, all right, I'll download it again and use it. And I've got Tweet Deck going, but I'm having a really hard time. It's only been a couple days, but I'm just really having a hard time getting into the groove as to how it works. Hey, oh, there she is. She's early for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. The meeting in two weeks. Hey, Melissa, how are you? Good. Can you guys hear me? Well, now we can. Awesome. <laughs> I had myself muted. So. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't get that link to you. I, did it not come through as a full link in the direct message? Um, I was using the one that Enzo was commenting on, but it didn't. It was just to watch you guys. It wasn't to actually yeah. talk or join. Yeah. That's. Not, I. I wish they would fix that and figure out a better way to define the difference between those two links. Yeah, yeah no, it should be one link. You get in there, you say, watch live or join. Yeah. It's one link. The user experience should be simpler than having two links that you have to look for. Yeah, yeah. And then as, as, us, as us hosting the Hangout, we should be able to just say approve or deny, you know? Or, yeah. Uh, it, you know? Well, at least, oh, well. Melissa, you're coming from Asia, right? Or somewhere in Asia? What? Are you coming from somewhere in Asia? Or? Oh, yeah. I was in Thailand for about a week and a half. It was pretty cool. It's fun. Thailand well, looked beautiful from all the Instagram oh, photos. My Instagram. That was funny because I was on there and Brent was like, he was like, why are you in Qatar? He was like, what are you doing in Qatar? <laughs> the first one that I saw, I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> It, you know, I thought maybe your business sent you there last minute or something. And I was like, this is weird. That'd be sweet. That'd be awesome if they did. <laughs> um, no, but Qatar was really cool too. I'd go there. Yes. It was. It was uh, in conjunction with our earlier conversation. The visuals she was sharing were uh, visually appealing and very well designed. Oh, oh Connie. Yeah, Connie. Connie was on earlier talking about her book. Yeah, I was bummed. I have I don't have her book, but I attended one of her sessions at Learning Solutions like two, two or three years ago, and oh. it was a really early morning one. Like I think it was like five a.m. or something ridiculous like that, and it was my favorite session of all time. She's so you know? good. She's so I'm sad good. that I didn't get to see her and like and tell her how much I loved it. I think she's going to join again sometime soon. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, she's uh, she works out of her house too, so she uh, she she's uh, she wants to hang out as well. So we'll just you know we'll just make it a crowd. Sounds good. 
So what have you been up to recently, Melissa? What kind of projects are you working on? Um, top secret projects that I can't talk about. Oh. And, <laughs> um, and then I'm doing a lot of stuff with, with blended learning. And let me think. I'm, I'm just trying to recuperate from being away and then being in Chicago. Um, <laughs> and then, I, well, obviously blogging and then the Articulate E-Learning e Heroes challenges on my spare time. So fun, that's about fun, it. Fun. Good times. Well, I we one of the things we talked about last week, and we thought you might be interested in, was um, the video challenge that I posted a while ago. Uh, if you would be interested in just offering up your comments on that, it doesn't mean you need to create anything or edit anything. Um, just take a look at this old video that I did uh, 25 years ago. It was in my during my undergrad. Um, Ooh. And I'm I'm looking for just for it to spark a conversation in the learning world around many different things, however it hits you. And so one of the ideas was, uh, you know, take a look at it and see, okay, you've been given a video like this. How would you read now today, having all the technology that we have available to us today? How would you uh, present this content? today versus what I did 25 years ago. Right. So that's right up your alley. There's the link. Where's the link? Yeah, where is the link? Uh, let me go find that real fast. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, um, Kristen Anthony might be really interested in that because she has been doing a lot with like After Effects and different things. She's really great at video stuff. Kristen Anthony. You need to invite her to our uh, hangout. Yeah, but like I said, I mean, it doesn't have to be a project where you actually have to do something. If you just want to comment, right? And oh, just yeah. So, you know, you know, what I would do is, oh, I would take something like this and I would chop it up and I would add links to Wikipedia or I would, I would go do another video on this or I would do an interactive 3D thing, you know, or, you know, whatever. You know, you don't actually have to build it. I think actually a couple people that I know actually are doing some rebuilds of it. Um, and I, I offer the video freely. Um, I can give you a Dropbox link to download it if you want as well. But yeah. I'll just shoot you a link to the blog post for now if I can find just it. Just a couple of paragraphs and bullet points on what you would do, right? Yeah. Or yeah, or we can just talk about it, just have another quick hangout, and we can you know just chat once people have had a chance to look at it. So it's just I think it's a I think it's one of those things where uh, you know it's kind of like the learning heroes challenges, right? Everybody likes a practical example and a, a practical way of of applying the things that you're learning and the things that you know. So um, you know, having found that old video after all these years, um, it kind of gave me an opportunity to have some old stuff and to. Uh, and figure it out. So why can't I find the right blog post? I agree. I feel like that's really cool. I haven't seen a challenge like that or anything like that. Yeah. All right. So I just saw that you wanted to talk about that. You know, maybe briefly before we uh, go on to our schedule. Uh, you want to talk about? You saw some. You, um, you had some ideas on LinkedIn plus Linda. Oh yeah. LinkedIn. Um, uh, wow, that was terrible. And I wrote a really long blog post about it. Oh, you did. I did. Yeah. Link, please. <laughs> oh, link. Uh, oh yeah, I'll get it. Hold on a second. Okay. Yeah, I got the I got the blog link in there now as well. Oh. But yeah. So yeah, that's so that's a great uh, great segue into a new topic. Um, uh, and, and we can go over a little bit, Enzo. It's okay. Um, but yeah, the whole LinkedIn, uh, Linda.com thing, that did stir up a lot of conversation and speculation, and I, I think uh, you made some outstanding points. I, so 
I feel like it's really hard to get your thoughts together when there's so much you want to say and you just want to respond really quickly to people. So that's why I wrote the post. And then I wrote the post and I was like, wait, there's so much more that I want to write. But I'm just going to try to keep my thoughts to myself because I talk way too much about that stuff. <laughs> Well, it just depends. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's always just fun to speculate and to think about what what could be, right? And what we in our profession either want it to be or or maybe even speculate on, you know, secret fears of what we what we fear it might become but we don't want it to become. <laughs> you know, those types of things too. I mean, there's yeah. there's all sorts of different ways to 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 parse, you know, the reality that it happened and kind of what they were thinking and what they see from a business perspective, right? But I think I think for me it solidifies the fact that and and I don't say this, you know, out loud in public too often, but there is definitely a very diff there's a split between, you know, in the business world, it's the content that has all the value, right? And and I know in our profession and when we talk about this in groups, it's you know, there's more to it than that, and it's more than just content. Instructional design is, you know, adds value and all this kind of stuff. You know, and a, a YouTube video just isn't all there is to it, and and whatever. But at the end of the day, when you're looking at it from a business perspective, they bought a boatload of content that took Lynda.com years to pull together, and actually, you know, have a they built this process up for creating those videos and for creating that learning. And so there's this machine that's in place to take subject matter experts and turn what it is that they know into a course or training or you know whatever they end up calling it. But there's a lot of value in that. It would take somebody a really long time to be able to kind of replicate that volume of content and the process you know, to, to make that happen and to be able to churn out that kind of content. So I think so. I think too that so, you know sometimes you know people might think LinkedIn is antiquated and all that kind of stuff, but it is the business network, right? Social network for business. So I'm thinking something like that. Maybe in soon we can see uh, uh, you know some plans where Linda courses are offered throughout the career of, of a, a new hire to succession and all that. I mean, it has so much potential for uh, not only hiring people, like if I'm a hiring manager, I look at somebody and I see on their LinkedIn profile that they have, uh, they at least express interest in taking courses X, Y, and Z and building their own career and going uh, out and trying to develop themselves because I see that they have tons of courses there from a platform like Linda, for example, on their profile attached to that. I can see their history. Uh, it, it's, it, it, LinkedIn is, could almost work as a... Uh, not an LMS, but a validation point for um, I am hiring the right person. person. Or I, it's pre-boarding. I don't have the person on my internal systems yet, but I can already start shaping them or offering them training, for example, that aligns with my company's goals. And, and here is the platform. They're already on LinkedIn anyway, so I can offer them in context where they are, the, the training, the guidance that is needed for them to assume that position in my company. You know, so I see a lot of potential for the networking around the content where it's needed and when it's needed there. I, yeah, I, I agree as well, and I wrote a little bit about that in my post. And I think that, um, oh, I wish I had it up right now because I don't want to say anyone's name wrong. Um, what is his? Is Ryan Roslansky said, Imagine being in a being a job seeker and being able to instantly know what skills are needed for the available jobs in a desired city like Denver, and then to be prompted to take the relevant and accredited course to help you acquire this skill. So I feel like that can be applied everywhere for everything. Like even if you already have a skill, like building on that skill, um, it's not just about you know the, a job that you want. It's about the job that you're in, and you know. Like I was saying, like say Brent takes a course. Oh, sorry. Say Brent takes a course, and I see that Brent took a course. Like if I could see it on his profile, I might be like, hey, I should probably take that course because Brent took it. Like that might be something that interests me. So if you think about it, that's really self-marketing. Like that's amazing. That's like huge. 
Like, if I didn't have a lynda.com account, I would buy one because, obviously, like, if Brent's taking something, I should probably be taking something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. Brent? <laughs> it, it is, uh, this, you're just about, using me metaphorically. I realize yeah. that. It's okay. Talk about a, a curation platform and a, and a social recommendation of valid content out there. Right, a place where I can discover content because my network is interested in there must be something in it, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. You know, recommending and well, this has really been the goal. I, I think there's a bright future there for that. Yeah, it's, it's, this has been this has been the dream, right? We've been always talking about ever since the birth of the first big giant LMS. Uh, you know, it, I think people realized right away. You're in a big company for 10 years, for example. All of your information, all of the courses you've taken, all, everything that you've learned that's been tracked has been now locked up inside this LMS within this one company. If you go to another company, that, the first company does not share all of that really great data with the second company that you go to. They could care less. They, they hang on to that data. That's it. And so we've always fantasized about how do we make... Uh, our own personal report card, if you will, and all that data travel with us, right? Like when you get a credential from a university, you shouldn't have to go back to that university to always get your transcripts and all that kind of stuff. There should be some sort of clearinghouse somewhere that validates yeah. that and, exactly. and all the other things you're in it. And it, I should own that, right? I should, I should own that proof and that data, or at least have ready free access to it that I can then share with others or that others can see or I can make available in whatever format I want to make it available, but it's mine and it travels with me. I go to one company, I learn a whole bunch of new stuff, I have a whole bunch of new experiences. That should be collected and gathered in something that I own that travels with me. It linked in. Which is what? Becomes that. Yeah. It's kind of like what, what is happening with the uh, Mozilla Open Badges and the Backpack, right? But I feel like it's not getting as much traction because now it is a, another platform you've got to go into. But how are you doing it? It's building on top of a network that already exists. It's one of those things that we've already been doing, and now LinkedIn is finally saying, I'm going to take it to the next level because I add my badges to my LinkedIn page like that I took this MOOC and you can add it like if you take a more a Coursera MOOC you get a certificate like they link right into LinkedIn so it's mm -hmm. kind of like they're just taking it to the next level if they do this um, and then for for the piece on data I put like I think data is the biggest thing it's gonna do the personalized learning for people and imagine if they open that data to corporations like Brent was saying but even like to a whole other level where we can see like what everyone in one specific corporation is taking so why is everyone in this company so focused on finance courses why are they so focused on these type of courses should we be focusing on something internally should we be you know doing this like how should we support them and what they're taking I mean it opens up so many other doors like you you think about all that data it's so valuable yeah True. craziness <laughs> it is but it'll be interesting like we've all said right I mean what's what's to come in the next year or so when uh, when all of this happens it's yeah, yeah, I mean it's interesting. Um, yeah. You know, think of think of all the things you could do too. Like, um, you know, all of the experience you're getting uh, doing these learning hero challenges, right? You know that that over time should be collected somewhere and and be given some sort of value so that somebody not only it's not just you saying, oh, I've worked with this particular tool for so long. It's you know, I built my first thing on this date. Here it is. You know, it was it was completed and connected to LinkedIn or whatever, or or some data was collected on the completion of it, and this is what it was. You know, and now you can start validating your work. And, That's you know, so true. Without work, you, know, you can just people can just see the work that you've done. Because you you right can already now do that. we can do that with open badges. And other solutions like that, but it's a manual, boring process. You've right. got to go there and do it. It's not as easy to do it. And making it easy and making the, that transparent is the next step that I think LinkedIn is doing. That. Yeah, because you can do it to LinkedIn on extent. Like I add my links to like my portfolio, like of things I've done onto LinkedIn, but it's not 
seamless. Like it's really annoying. Like you have to add the link and then you have to like add your picture. And like if you could just link everything in on LinkedIn together versus like reaching out to somewhere else, it would be so much better. Like I it just drives me nuts having to manage all that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to do it, but I I really don't do much on that because it's like ah, I gotta take another thirty minutes to link all the stuff that I've done. Yeah, yeah mine's not even current; it's like months old. <laughs> so, I mean, there's they still need improvement in so many areas, so it's gonna be interesting to see yeah. what they bring in. Yeah. All right. Well, should we wrap this up for the day? Only if Melissa promises she'll be back in two weeks. Yeah, sure. Are you go you're going to ATD, right, Brent? Yep. And then, and Enzo, are you going to ATD? I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> it's coming up really quickly. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going. Uh, I know I'm going to online learning to to the training magazine one in Denver. Oh, oh I'm yeah, I'm gonna have a session at that. Yeah, I'm I'm co-hosting something, uh, uh, Maker Fair, uh, with uh, Carl Kopp and and a few other people. Oh, fun! On, uh, yeah, it should be fun. Well, it's nice. a weekend. You'll be. Holding... I'll be there. Is it? Yep. Nice. Oh, we'll see you there. All right. Yeah, I just found out uh, the other day that I'll be doing a presentation there, so it's good. Be fun. Well, I don't, I don't think I've ever given a presentation at that event before, so I'm looking forward to it. I applied to, but I'm doubting that's going to happen, but I'm still going to go anyway. <laughs> what were you going to present on if you were accepted? I, you know what? I don't even like the word presenting because I don't like to get up and preach to people about stuff. I like to have it be more interactive, so I was going to do more of a thing on like 2D game design, but it was going to be more of giving everyone the tools so that they can do it and having it be more, you know, pull, like, what are you looking for? Like, how can we make this happen the way that you want it to happen? Like, that type of thing versus me getting up and preaching about yeah. stuff. And then me telling people, you know, like, this is how long it would typically take to develop something based on, like, all the stuff that I've been developing. Um, just so they know. Yeah. But, Sounds like something similar to the Maker Fair, but there is going to be like a little table there about gaming design. Uh, I, I, you know, I hope it gets accepted and you get to to go there. I, I would attend that definitely. Well, if it doesn't, I'm still going to do it anyway. I'm just not going to be doing it there. I'll just do it online. So. Or somewhere else. <laughs> no yeah. one's stopping me. <laughs> <laughs> My lights. That's what we love about this millennial generation. Don't ask permission, just do it. And you'll let us know where and when, and we'll join. Uh, all right. Well, I'm. I'll be there irregardless. So I'll see you guys there, and I'll see Brent at ATD, I guess. And yep. I don't know who else. There's a bunch of people going. Sweet. Awesome. So let's wrap it up, Enzo. Where can people find you? EnzoSilva.com. Perfect. That's easy. Melissa, you don't have to be so short. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess you guys can find me at Mel Milloway on Twitter and all my information's on my Twitter profile so it's pretty easy <laughs> good enough place as any alright perfect I'm Brent Schlenker with uh, litmus.com we've got a uh, as a part of the Calidus Cloud company there's the Calidus Cloud Connections event coming up uh, in May, which is very cool. It's an interesting event, seeing as though it's got uh, the training and learning angle uh, mixed in with uh, marketing and sales. So uh, if you guys know anybody that is specifically focused on doing uh, learning type stuff for the sales and marketing community, this would be a very, very interesting place to be able to uh, hang out with this particular mix. I, I, uh, I went to it last year when I first started with Litmus, and I was so new, it was a little overwhelming to me, but I'm really looking forward now that I've kind of got my feet planted on the ground a little bit and going and, uh, and getting a, uh, a lot closer to this sort of sales and marketing crowd and how learning uh, impacts and, and plays a role with them but in general it's going to be a good show good good fun event to go to as well but uh, then we've got ice ATD ice coming up 
and then uh, a bunch of others as well. So it'll be good times. Thanks for joining us again, and uh, we'll do it again in two weeks. Thank you, guys. We'll see you, Mel. And...